In this episode, we'll be talking about what it takes to design highly impactful design teams. We'll talk about how leadership has to evolve to support these design teams. And we'll talk about why we've been thinking about employee experience in a completely wrong way all the time. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I am Bernardo, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design and deliver services that have a positive impact on people and are good for business. My guest in this episode is the founder of a strategic design studio called Uncommon, and he's the co-founder of a mezcal company. His name is Bernardo Torres. In this episode, Bernardo and I will be addressing a really interesting theme, and that is how to design highly impactful design teams. Because as more and more design teams uh, are built in-house within uh, large organizations, the question becomes, how do you structure these design teams? How do you uh, not take the soul away and still keep that, but sort of create new standards and structures and processes that allow these teams to be more impactful, not only efficient, but also to be more impactful and do their work faster and better. So the question is that we'll be addressing in this episode, how do you design highly impactful design teams? If this is your first time here on this channel, don't forget that we bring new videos every week. So if you want to level up your service design skills, click that subscribe button and that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are out. And I also have a free training on how to explain service design in plain English. The link is down below in the show notes. So if that's what you're looking for, check the show notes down below. That's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Bernardo. Welcome to the show, Bernardo. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, really awesome to uh, have you on the show all the way from Madrid today, right? Yes, I'm in Madrid right now. All right. Although I live in Mexico City, by the way. Exactly. So uh, that was my first question for the people who don't know who Bernardo is. Give us a really short introduction about yourself. Well, I am uh, the founder of director and director of Uncommon Design Strategy, a boutique design strategy firm uh, that was originally founded in Mexico City and that operates in uh, Madrid, Buenos Aires, and starting 2019, uh, Bogotá too. All right. Uh, you also told me something interesting about a side, side project that you do, right? <laughs> Yes, I, I am a partner at the Mezcal company, which uh, has nothing to do with uh, design strategy for now. And it's really interesting to be living like in the world of innovation, technology and stuff. And on the other side, be in the world of the soil, the plants, mm. the families, the traditions, you know. Mm. So uh, where everyone is making craft beer, you just went into tequila Mezcal. <laughs> I also had my craft beer face. <laughs> it was like seven years ago. Um, Bernardo, do you remember the very first time you heard about service design? Yes. Uh, it actually kind of completely shifted my career, actually. Mm. What happened? Um, when was that? I was working for this big Spanish insurance company. Uh, I was in charge of uh, developing like the new business model regarding direct sales, mm -hmm. everything I had to do with e-commerce and digital presence and stuff. Uh, and uh, I don't know, this was maybe 2009. Uh, and I got into service design in the understanding that it, that it would be like the best approach in terms of developing uh, this new project. And I kind of got like really into it. And eventually I studied a master's degree around it. And eventually I resigned from the insurance company and started my own. Mm. 
And, and do you remember who gave it? Who uh, who gave you the first hint about service design? I who, guess who got you fired person? eventually? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the exact person. Mm. Well, at that time, this insurance company that I was working for was developing a spin-off uh, in Spain that was being developed through design methodologies. Uh, and there was this big uh, the service design innovation firm behind the right. work. Mm. And that eventually, but I don't remember if there was a person in particular, mm. uh, in particular or I was just involved in the project conceptually and, and, and I got excited. Uh, so right. I, I can't, there were, I, I, can re I can remember a couple of names maybe uh, the digital director of this insurance company, Jose Luis, and a good friend of mine that works in uh, in, far in a pharmaceutical company, uh, mm -hmm. Rogelio. They were like the first that uh, I talked about design, service design, like maybe nine, ten years ago. And, and the rest is history. <laughs> yes. Bernardo, you had uh, some really interesting topics uh, to talk about uh, in preparation. So I gave you a few question starters. Uh, those are in Madrid right now. I have your topics here. Are you ready to start? Are you ready to do some interview jazz? Yes. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pick your first topic. No, I'm going to pick your second topic. I'm going to, we're doing interview okay. jazz. So, uh, all right. The first topic for this episode is design ops. What is your question starter? Why? <laughs> that's an easy one. <laughs> no, that, that's an easy one, but I think it's that, like the most interesting one. Uh, Tell us. You know, I, I, I come from a big company that it's like, that was completely uh, all around processes and operations and performance and stuff. And mm. then I eventually got into the completely other side, which is like design and uh, creativity and the sensitivity of the designers. Uh, so uh, I think and, uh, uh, that design ops are like super important, but at the same time, and I don't want to like hurt anyone's feelings here, but I think Design ops is just a sexy name for uh, process oriented work. You know, I think it's super important. I think technology and developers have been doing it for years. And I just think that designers needed to find a way to work more efficiently. Uh, and it, it's so it's cool. So, what is design ops for you? What does the term behold? I'm probably going to just reduce it into terms uh, of how I see it for now. It might yeah. be broader than that. But, I'm interested uh, in your perspective. For me, like design ops is this understanding on how to systematize, I don't know if that's the correct mm -hmm. word, mm -hmm. uh, teams in order to make design more efficient okay. and to make design more goal-oriented and to make design teams more uh, collaborative and uh, I think one of the most important things around like process oriented work is to have standards and to be able to measure standards on the way teams and people develop their work you know and I think that's something that has always been difficult for designers and design ops is trying to understand how to uh, I don't know like make a bridge in between how big corporations are understanding and are capitalizing design. Mm. And um, this seems like a, a really interesting topic for large companies, but do you also, are you applying this way of thinking in your own business? Yeah, 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 totally. Uh, how? Uh, how? That's how why I it? think it's, uh, <laughs> the thing is that when we started the company, nearly five years ago, like we had this hippie heart around the work we were going to do, you know, like, we're going okay, to for the every, world. <laughs> yes, 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 for every challenge, we're going to, uh, I don't know, create a small team, two or three designers, and then a couple of mentors are going to work around this team and eventually we're going to help organizations transform and impact the world. And that's still something that we want to, to achieve. Uh, the thing is that we found ourselves uh, 
depending a lot on what different designers and different teams understood around the work they had to do. Uh, you know, so we've been developing our own uh, operation model. You know, our own uh, our own process oriented uh, design approach. That it's important in terms not just only on the, uh, of the end result, mm -hmm. but uh, particularly important in terms of what are the standards and the expectations on, of, of the designers working through these projects. You know, we eventually got to a point where we needed operations uh, mm -hmm. in terms why, of... Why have, did you need um, operations? Because it was inefficient? <laughs> it's not only about inefficiency, because I think sometimes design uh, mm -hmm. needs to be inefficient in terms yeah. of creating something. But I think uh, especially was important in terms of people. People needed to, uh, to, to... Designers needed to know what was expected of them, what were uh, more or less the... the Time, the methods, the moments, the the, the standards uh, they needed to achieve in terms of the work that they were doing, and not everyone can be like this eureka designer that eventually develops something. Uh, most of the most of us need uh, standards and need a process and need something and someone to more or less guide us around the work that we're doing. You know, um, and this is particularly relevant in terms of design strategy because it kind of sounds like we're going the other way, but it's not. We, we have to understand what's a super flexible process, but at the same time, a process that sets standards, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, what is the place, industry or sector that we can sort of um, get inspiration from regarding operationalizing, structuring, standardizing design? Where, where do you look for inspiration on this topic? I guess, uh, like, the immediate references that come to mind uh, are the, like, uh, native digital startups from Silicon Valley, especially those that eventually scaled up uh, a mm -hmm. lot and that uh, uh, started out as uh, hybrid teams of designers and developers, you know? so mm -hmm. So... Uh, most of the small design companies, particularly the ones that, that focus on digital products, they just like kind of work chaotically around how to develop and how to design. Uh, and growth eventually needed processes and operations. So I would say that I would, I would look at companies maybe like Spotify, Airbnb, uh, these companies that are actually also like posting the, their processes and their philosophy behind how designer and technologists uh, should work in terms of beer being more efficient and not efficient in terms of money and time, but efficient in terms of it's impact. About more Im yeah, exactly. Yes. exactly. It's about being more impactful. I totally agree. Yeah. This is a totally. topic that hasn't been on the show a lot. So, uh, and I think it's super interesting. So I hope uh, more guests will uh, touch upon this. We're, in the meantime, moving on to uh, a second topic uh, cool. <clears throat> that sort of relates to this one. Uh, and it's the topic of design and leadership. Once Boom. again, the question, do you have a question starter? Uh, Don't cheat. <laughs> Don't cheat. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, I'm, I'm cheating, actually. That's really close to my heart right now. Uh, I'm supposed to develop a question right now, right? Uh, yes. Um, Pick one. How how can we? So the quest the question that has been running in my mind quite oftenly uh, is how can we design or redesign leadership on terms of new talent? You know, uh, and I, the only way to talk about this is from my own personal experience. I, I, mm -hmm. I come from a very traditional background in terms of the companies that I was working uh, at. And eventually I developed my own company and uh, I found myself having certain behaviors that uh, I challenged when I was uh, with those kind of leaders, you know? Uh, so I think leadership particularly has to be redesigned on terms of how organizations are being redesigned, you know? Uh, 
we're, we're actually uh, jumping uh, on the way that people get together in terms of a purpose uh, mm -hmm. into new paradigms that we and new values that we cannot understand yet. You know, we're like jumping from the organizations uh, focused only on growth, on money, on exponential everything, on technology. Uh -huh. And uh, that needs a certain type of leadership. It's a leadership that it's, uh, I would like to say, well, it's not that I like, but I, I, I might say like more maybe paternalist, more uh, 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 ambitious, you know? Uh, and that kind of leadership it's linked to a particular set of, of values, you know? Uh, and right now we are emerging into a new kind of organization, organizations that are understanding how this impact that we were talking about uh, before um, is relevant not only to, uh, to the growth of the company, but for the well-being of a society or a country or the world now no? that we're in... in, in this type of big world challenges. And I think that leadership has to completely be reimagined. Uh, for starters, most of the people that manage teams tend to have uh, strong egos, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I myself, uh, I'm, uh, I am in that group of people. And it's super tough to understand that you have to break your own values and that you have to reimagine yourself and to reimagine what really ego means in terms of developing people that trust that the work that you're doing is going to be linked to their set of values. So uh, leadership on, on, on terms of design and redesigning the leadership, I think it has to be in terms of understanding the real and emerging values of people and understanding where you see gaps and as a leader, being able to develop these abilities that you still find missing in terms of eventually creating organizations that can be self-managed, that can be totally horizontal, that can be uh, impactful. You know, I think I maybe uh, got all over the place in the in 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 the topic, but uh, I'm gonna try to synthesize. Uh, I think. Uh, Redesigning leadership means that most of the people that are in charge of teams have to start by auto-evaluating and redesigning themselves and the way they see the world, and that they have to become more mentors and researchers of what the talent needs and is missing in terms to help them uh, become the people that will develop the new set of values for new companies. Mm. I, I, I already feel that this is a topic that is super dear to your to your heart, and uh, you already said I uh, I can only refer to my personal experience. You're leading uh, uh, a studio, you're leading uh, teams. How has your perspective, or maybe your style of leadership, changed in the last five years? And how is it changing? How do you how do you hope that it will change in the next five years? Well, I don't know. Your, your, personal, I, I guess your personal style. Yeah. I, I, I'm a super energetic person. So energetic. So I have a, not, a lot of energy and that uh, can be represented in the way I talk, in the way I move, in how I manage the room, you know. And uh, not everyone can get involved with this kind of energy in terms of, of work. So when I used to work closely with, I don't know, the first team I had on Uncommon when we were five or six people, it was, I'm going to say, easy. Because I had the time to, to get involved with everyone in terms of, of understanding the, the gaps that they had in terms of ability mm -hmm. of uh, what we as a group wanted to achieve. But eventually we got to 15. Mm -hmm. And then... It wasn't easy for me to get involved with everyone. And then eventually we got to nearly 30. And it's completely, uh, it's, it's almost impossible for me to get involved with 30 people in the, in the everyday. Um, what I missed that is that I had to develop other leaders. So eventually it was like the company was uh, a big army uh, with no direction, you know, like going everywhere and 
And we're actually working on developing new leaders uh, and on uh, setting these standards and these processes in terms of how people interact with each other, how people interact with managers and leaders. And I guess what I would like to see of myself in the future is being more of a mentor in terms of how to uh, drive people to become better leaders uh, instead of telling people what to do. And it's a two-way street. Uh, how, so? talent, how is it a two-way street? Yeah, I think that also people that are uh, starting to work in this type of companies uh, have to understand the responsibility, the accountability uh, in terms of what is expected of them in a company with no like direct guidelines or bosses or people telling you what to do, you know? So it's rough because people, uh, most of the people in my, ex my experience for now need others to tell them what to do. Mm. Uh, so mm -hmm. we have to change in, in these both ways. People have to change in terms of, okay, now you're here, you know what the purpose is. And if you don't know, ask and get yourself involved. And then uh, look, go make some questions and look for answers, you know? But now people mm. kind of expect for you to tell them exactly what to do in every step. Mm. And it's, so, so that is, makes is, it difficult. Is, is leadership uh, becoming more distributed? I don't know if that's the right word, but it, it, of course it's changing. Uh, but is it also becoming more distributed? Totally. That's that's the thing. Uh, the, mm. I've been like reading around this uh, book from uh, Frederic Lalou uh, that is called Reinventing Organizations, and he actually uh, at the at the beginning of the book he talks about the uh, evolution of consciousness of people. Uh, and 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 the step that we're that people, uh, the Homo sapiens, is getting into the evolution of the consciousness has to do with distributed everything, you mm. know. And mm -hmm. and I think it's quite cool. But at the same time, I think that we have triggers in our life that kind of shift our consciousness. You know, if you're in a situation of being, uh, I don't know, a violent situation, let's say a car uh, is like almost going to hit you. Uh, you 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 react in terms of different levels of consciousness. You get much more aggressive, more, you know. Uh, so it's not that we're eventually gonna evolve and everything is gonna be like flowers and rainbows and. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think, uh, particularly in in organizations, small or big, there has to be a great set of tools. Uh, norms uh, uh, on how people should interact and this is going to help distribute leadership, li distribute work and make everything more horizontal. It's not mm -hmm. just about making your hierarchy uh, instead of 10 levels, just three. It's in terms of how you distribute how exactly. people make choices. Yeah, yeah. exactly. exactly. <clears throat> and this ties in, I think, to your third and final topic really well because... I don't know if you remember, of course you do. Your third and final topic is about employee experience. And you know the drill. That's the jazz. Give me a, give me a question <laughs> starter. Okay. Um, how can we push or incentivize employee experience? Uh, I, I'm actually in Madrid because last week I... I made a small course around employee experience and it's i would say maybe a kind of new topic mm -hmm. but at the same time for service designers uh, it's not new because we've been executing more or less the same mindset and the same process in terms of how we inter how, how companies interact with their customers uh, and this is the mindset that employee experience ne needs to get from the, I don't know, uh, the line of duty inside, you know. Uh, the thing is that you're not going to particularly look to for product or uh, for channels to interact or the emotions of the customer. You have, you're have you going to have to understand what are the stages around how a person gets involved in the work. Uh, mm -hmm. And most companies, like modern companies, 
are measuring employee satisfaction in terms of something that it's called engagement. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah. engagement mostly means if you're satisfied and happy at work. But this actually means that you have to divide yourself in what is your work and what is your life. And uh, I think that something that I've been uh, discovering lately is that there is not really a division around that, you know. Uh, we are the people we are when we're at work and when we're not at work. Um, and we take our work to our house, at least in our minds, and we take our personal self to work. Uh, so employee experience, what it's supposed to be focused on is on understanding employees as persons, as humans. Instead of and, employees. And <laughs> exactly. In term, in, instead of this like, uh, transactional understanding, uh, like uh, in, uh, making it a little bit extreme, like, hello, uh, Mark, welcome to uh, your new job. Here's your hammer. Uh, here are the nails, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. you to, you know, that's the super uh, utility-oriented work. And now most of the work that we do, it's creative. Uh, not only for designers, for everyone. Uh, everyone is imagining new ways of doing stuff. Everything that ha that, that cannot be do done through creativity and imagination and it's supposed to be automated in the really short term, you know. Uh, and 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 employee experience, what what it's focused on is understanding uh, how to evolve from this transactional uh, interaction or from this utility driven interaction into something that uh, drives people to take their whole selves to work. Uh, so and, what, and what does this what does this mean for organizations that are interested in uh, providing a better employee experience? Or, or is the, I or guess sh or should we let should we should we let the term employee experience go because I don't think that we have to let it go. Uh, it's like if we said that we should let the service design concept go because mm -hmm. every organization should design every interaction. It's already service. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think that companies should be much more sensitive uh, to what people are looking behind the job and why is it that people are getting involved with an organization, not just in terms of uh, money or in terms of a career, but in terms of, uh, of the impact they're looking for, their values. And this is something that it's going to continue to grow. No? We're living in this world where there are different generations more or less uh, serving the, the workplace. But uh, eventually the new generations are starting to get much more involved in the impact positive or negative that uh, organizations uh, are uh, driving. And this is going to be a serious uh, characteristic of, of the type of job you're, that you were going to be willing to do in the future, you know? And so, is, this, is this sort of related to, this is the thing that comes to my mind, obviously, the, the why of a company? Is it like... Um, yeah, totally. The purpose? But I was actually, why are we on earth? Yeah. The thing is that uh, we even did that why thing in Uncommon and we eventually understood that the why thing that we did was like kind of impossible, you know? So I guess the why might be this uh, north that we set our minds to. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in terms of employees, the concept that I like is like the employer vision. How is this purpose... Uh, translated into the actions that an organization makes in terms of making their the people that interact with them, their employees, the their the best version of themselves. You know how sounds complicated. Uh, what do you, can you explain? Like, uh, for example, let, let's say that you, as an organization, want to uh, make a positive impact in the world in terms of. Uh, let's say uh, reducing uh, your carbon emissions mm -hmm. as an organization. No? We want to be the cleanest company 
in the world and to make the world the cleanest place on the galaxy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm just mm -hmm. fiction mm -hmm. here. So what is it that you need in terms of doing that? You need people that get engaged with that. And how is it that you can make people get engaged with that? You have to develop that kind of sensitivity. You know? So your employer vision must be, we're going to develop uh, employees with the cleanest minds in the world like with or with the cleanest sensitivity. Uh, and this is important because if you are inviting someone to join your company uh, and your purpose is to be the cleanest organization in the world and to make the world the cleanest place, uh, and this person outside is like throwing garbage into the street, you know, you, you as an organization have to be uh, congruent in terms of how you can change that person or maybe how that person doesn't really fit your exactly. yeah. purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So, so empl your employer vision has to be a much more actionable way of uh, pushing your employees to serve the same purpose of the, as the organization is trying to serve. Mm. That's really interesting because that actionable part is really the hard part. It's sort of, it's not easy, I would say, but it's, it, it, it is easy to formulate a vision or a goal or a why, you know, and then operationalizing it, making it uh, actionable. That's, that's really the challenging part, I think, in a lot of cases. Yeah, totally. But if we cross this with like, for example, let's say design ops, like yeah, yeah. the more traditional... The more traditional process-oriented work uh, has this really big component in terms of how you measure people. And you measure mm, people yeah. in terms of a set of values or abilities. And once a value or an ability is integrated into a person, you stop measuring it. And then you go for another one. You know, that let's say uh, people need to be like 100% assertive with the way they communicate. You have to measure that at first because you want to develop that ability. But when, once you have evidence that this ability is completely integrated in everyone in your team, you stop measuring that and you go uh, mm -hmm. for something else. This is why it's something that is going to be evolving and emerging consistently. Uh, Bernardo, super interesting, uh, but we're running out of time in uh, this episode. So there is one final thing I want to ask you. And I... I I think you didn't prepare this one, so this is really jazz. And that is, is there a question you have for us, the viewers and the listeners of the Service Design Show? Is there anything on your mind that you would like to ask us where we can think about, comment on? What would I uh, ask, like, the community? Uh, yeah. What, what would you like to ask us? Okay. How can... We service designers, strategic designers, um, create more impact or deliver more impact. All Is right. it just yeah. like more experience? Is it more uh, academic background? Um, is it more critical thinking? Uh, and is it, if it is critical thinking, how can we develop more critical thinking around the world? I'm, I'm going to reframe or reformulate that question because I think it's really <laughs> okay. interesting again. I, I, would, I would sort of like to reformulate your question to what is preventing you right now from making more impact or you know, reaching your f full potential as a service designer? How's that? Well, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> Well, that is, we don't have to answer that. <laughs> we'll leave it there, up to the community. We'll leave it up to the community <laughs> to answer that. Cool, cool. Yeah, um, okay. Bernardo, it uh, has become dark in Madrid. It's already dark in Utrecht for a while. Um, it was really fun to have you on. I really appreciate that you took the Thank time. Thank you so much. Uh, it's super nice to make the connection and hear what's, what's on your mind because I think these topics are, are really the future of service design. So thanks again for sharing, Bernardo. Thank, thank you. This, this is Mezcal, by the way. This is why I was like <laughs> talking so much. <laughs> Thanks again, man. So getting back to Bernardo's question, what's the thing that's holding you back from being more impactful as a service designer? Leave a comment down below and join the conversation. And if you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you grab the link 
and share it with someone who might benefit from it as well. And don't forget that you can also sign up for my free course on how to explain service design in plain English. The link is over here. Thanks again for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.